Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Toby, and welcome to my talk about pluralistic deployment pipelining, um, as the front, as the title said. Uh, to my uh, to my own person, I'm uh, uh, I'm a principal software engineer for Mainz for Global Operations. Um, I'm also an AWS Cloud architect, and uh, with, uh, so that means I have a focus on the on the AWS uh, well architecture framework implementation or organization. And um, today's talk mainly will be about the operational excellence pillar. Um, I've been with Siemens for the last four years, I believe. I've uh, spent my time uh, exclusively with Mainstream Operations. And I want to give you a bit of an uh, overview today of about how we design our pipelines to be able to deploy one, one and the same piece of software to multiple locations and target systems. Oh. Okay, so we are talking about pluralistic deployment. First of all, um, uh, again, um, what are we, um, what is it about, who am I? So this is me, as you can guess, a um, bit shorter hair, a uh, bit more formal. Um, uh, my email address is is public, so if you have any questions, anything that I can help you with, as I said, I'm mo mo mainly a software architect, uh, you can at any time contact me, uh, also outside of this conference, and I will try to do my best to help you. Um, when it comes to Mindsphere, most of the people know Mindsphere, but just a very short overview and introduction, Mindsphere is an industrial IoT platform that we have been uh, working on for the last uh, couple of years. We are in the Gartner Magic Quadrant, we are one of the leaders in IoT platforms. And um, if you want to, if you are curious and just want to say, "Hey, I want to play around with Mindsphere a bit, and learn what what is it, what how can I use it, how can I leverage that?" There is a start for free link in the slide. That I think it's also in the slides that, that will be made available to everybody. Um, and you can link, uh, you can click on it. You can create. You will have to enter your email address, and you will uh, get a, a free tenant that's a bit limited. And we will will be guided through the onboarding uh, through the onboarding tour to onboard, for example, your mobile phone as an IoT device, and then see data and play with data. That being said, um, let's go into the in today's topic. So, what are we even talking about? What uh, the the title is pluralistic deployment pipelining. So we have to deploy something. So what are we deploying? And um, as it, as as it uh, we are building a modern platform, we are de deploying microservices. They come in different shapes, in different versions. The, um, um, the basic principle is, according for people who are fans of Martin Fowler, for example, is that microservices are separated from each other by customer problem domain. And that means, for example, you can have a microservice that handles all the, uh, that, that manages all the identities of a customer. You have another microservice that manages uh, flat data storage or unstructured data storage, like a data lake. You have, um, you have a microservice that uh, takes care of time series data storage, requesting time series data with, with different granularities, um, having uh, basically long time storage doing aggregates and so on and so forth. You have kind of we have event management. We have we have a connectivity service that just takes care about connecting and, and maintaining protocol connectivity to IoT devices and so on and so forth. So when we talk about these microservices, um, this is what, uh, what a lot of people that I know uh, sarcastically call like the marketing view on development. There's a developer, we want to go, that's the start, we have developers. And at the end, we want to produce customer value because that's what our customers are paying us for. They produce, they get value out of using our platform, and that's why they want to pay us to use our platform. And the thing in the middle is kind of like magic, and that's actually what we want to talk about today. So from the previous from the previous two slides, we already know some things about this magic. We know, but since we are, um, we know that we want to deploy microservices, and we know. Since we are working mostly with some sort of implementation of a Turing machine, that uh, or uh, a hybrid of a Neumann architecture, that means at some point we want to produce source code. And then there's still this magic in the middle, 
And this magic is actually what we want to talk about today. Going into the detail, into some details, let's have a look uh, at the anatomy of a microservice. And this is uh, basically which kind, which layers of functionality and code do exist within the microservice. First of all, on the top, we have the thing everybody thinks about when we talk about programming, and that is the service code itself. That's written in Java, in Node.js, in Go, in Python, in whatever, um, in, in any programming language. And that's actually what tackles the customer problem domain and solves customer requests. That um, this service code is then hosted somewhere. It can be hosted directly on a server in your data center. It can be hosted on, if you talk about AWS, uh, on an EC2 machine directly as a Linux um, systemd service, for example. We can, of course, also, uh, uh, also containerize it and host it on any container as a service platform or directly on, on a Kubernetes cluster that we host. Or we can go into the more modern technologies that become with cloud, like function as a service, AWS Lambda, Azure Functions, for example, host our service code there. Of course, the third part is we need to persist data somewhere. And this is where normal databases come into play. Uh, SQL stores, no SQL stores, caches. There are a couple of more ways to persist data. Blob storage comes to mind. And then there is uh, to um, build out your architecture. For example, for communication, you want stuff like queues for, uh, to, to store your secrets properly, like database credentials. You need secret stores. If you talk about AWS, if you want to manage some um, access to your AWS environment, you need something like AWS IAM. And this is all of this is summed up in the periphery category. And of course, there is also a layer underneath that that we will um, talk about, but, but we will not look uh, very closely into today. And that's like the real hardware. So where is actually the real machines, the real machines that are providing the compute power and the storage for whatever we are doing. And there are different flavors. We have infrastructure as a service from AWS Azure, Alibaba, for example. There is bare metal, which is like um, data centers, servers. Of course, there can be virtualization layers, like on, for example, on VMware, and so on and so forth. So let's, um, uh, uh, so now we know what we, what we are deploying. It's a microservice, and we want to produce customer value. So now let's talk about, when you talk about deployment, we need a target. So let's talk about our target system. And the first target system for Mainsphere, also historically, the first target system for Mainsphere was, uh, was AWS. That means we are a big AWS customers. We run, uh, we run uh, lots and lots of accounts with AWS, and uh, we deploy our software to AWS. We have our databases as infrastructure, as a service uh, in AWS. And um, this is what we will talk about first up. So, how do we do this? Let's start where we started when we had a look at this magic between developer and customer value. Our developers produce source code. Not only that, since we are in the cloud, we also can, uh, also our infrastructure can be codified. This, has, uh, this uh, actually gives you the opportunity to, first of all, version your infrastructure, because this now it's code, so now you can version it, for example, in Git. You can test it. You can do static code analysis on your infrastructure setup before you deploy anything. And of course, you can reuse it. When you have a staging system for your environment, like an integration stage, a pre-production stage, and a production stage, you can really make sure with infrastructure as code that you replicate your infrastructure setup in a, in a perfectly. You can, you can test your infrastructure on your integration system. And then you can really say, hey, this is the tested code. We know the quality of this piece of code. And now we transport it to pre-prod. And now we transport it to prod. All this code is managed in GitLab, uh, more specifically in CodeSiemens.com, which Ro Rocher's team is so very graciously providing to all of us. Um, and then we leverage GitLab CI, which is GitLab's internal CI CD language, to deploy this, uh, this whole stack of service code, hosting engine, data persistence layer and periphery to the AWS account. In AWS terms, um, um, so a service code is a Docker image, a char, um, um, a, a Java jar archive, jar file, 
or for example, for Lambda, it can be a zip file. Uh, a hosting engines, AWS, very shortly, Lambda for function as a service, ECS for container as a service with Fargate in combinations. We are met, uh, like more low, uh, more lower on, on infrastructure as code would be easy too. As databases will leverage the NemoDB um, for blob storage, S3 and RDS for relational databases. And as per, for periphery, as already said, AWS SNS for notifications, SQS for queues, uh, and, and for example, IAM and systems managers or secret manager for secret stores. So this is a basic pipeline. With this, you can, you will, you can develop your code, you will have it versioned, you can, you can uh, replicate it over all the systems that you of all your stages that you have, and this works very well. But what happens if some if suddenly somebody requests a few yes, we, we like AWS. AWS is awesome. It works very well, but we have customers that would like to actually uh, work on different on different hyperscalers too. So um, for example, what if we said, yeah, in addition to AWS, please deploy everything to Azure. And for our market, for our customers in China, we also have we also have a cooperation with Alibaba. Now please also port this all of this to Alibaba. And uh, this is actually what happened to us. So this really, this really happened to Mindsphere. Um, you can we have Mindsphere under the EU one host DNS DNS zone that's AWS, and under the EU two um, um, DNS zone that's actually on Azure. Um, it's the same system. Their version, uh, their versions are actually synchronous. With uh, I think uh, with a couple of weeks delay, but uh, but they are mostly synchronous which means if a feature is on AWS, it's also on Azure. And that's why we will uh, also not talk much about Alibaba because due to the nature of Alibaba that it's more in the, in the, than it's in the Chinese market, it's a more encapsulated systems. So you have, we have separate teams from, from, that work directly in China that maintain that. That's why we will today more focus on Azure and AWS, but the, all the concepts that we talk about are extendable also to Alibaba. So, how do we, how we, what do we have to modify? How do, how do we extend our pipeline now? First of all, let's have a look at the uh, hosting stack again, uh, at the microservice stack again. We have service code, hosting, data persistence periphery on AWS in Terraform, mostly in Terraform code, everything that's an AWS uh, service. Now, what can we, what, what do we have to do to uh, basically make, an, uh, to, to abstract Service code you can separate actually in a business logic. Actually, the thing that uh, tackles the customer, the customer problem domain, and the AWS adapter, and that's basically just an interface that talks to AWS specific services. Basically, that instruments the either, for example, the AWS API library to um, to talk to AWS DynamoDB for um, NoSQL store and. Once we have separated this out, we can simply replicate whatever we need to replicate for sure. That means we now, in addition, we, we uh, write a new adapter for Azure service interfacing, and we replicate the hosting stack, data persistence, and periphery with um, Azure native components. And I can already hear questions here, and this is are the same questions that most likely that we have asked ourselves, and that is, um, okay, um, why do you use native components? Why not just port everything to Kubernetes and also the database and periphery and be happy with that? And this is because of operation, mostly about operational effort and cost. Um, AWS managing stateful services like data persistence or queues and doing operational duties like upgrading them by, with zero downtime. And this is something we guarantee our customers. We don't have downtimes. Um, are very uh, limited, uh, uh, very limited, have uh, only have very limited downtimes. Um, it's a lot of work and you need very in-depth knowledge about the database engine that you're running. And um, you usually will not be able to do it as cost efficient and as performant as the cloud hyperscaler will provide it to you. And therefore we decided, yes, we will use um, cloud native components together with adapters to deploy to two different target systems. And we call this a cloud-aware service pattern. It's not cloud, 
abstracted. It's a, the, the code is aware of where it's deployed, but we really want to reshare as much source code as possible. That's why we separated out the business log. Pulling this together, we have, again, the container image on top that we can deploy, and we have the service infrastructure as code. Uh, now, um, there is another layer here that we can actually pull out to make our lives a bit easier. You have to remember each, each of these stacks needs to be created per microservice. That means if you can lose one layer, that's actually a lot of less work that you have per microservice, especially not only developing, but also operating that microservice. And that's why uh, uh, we chose that we have as a hosting engine Kubernetes, and in this case, like the hyperscaler native Kubernetes implementations for AWS, that would be AWS EKS, and for, and for Azure, it's, it's Azure AKS. And that's basically now shared across microservices as a hosting engine. And therefore, um, each, um, each single microservice is actually free of having to maintain that layer. Now, let's go back to our code pipeline. How does this, how has it changed? So um, the AKS, the AKS, so the Kubernetes layer, now is shared across services, and we have a central team that maintains that. So no, basically, our, uh, that, that's no longer part of the of our of our normal teams that develop service code, but we have a central team that maintains this infrastructure code and updates and deploys that. In addition to the source code that we had before um, and the AWS IIC, we also have Azure IIC for uh, data persistence and periphery on Azure and AWS. Um, and that's what the developer is actually creating. We then, uh, as I said, the central team sets up and maintains the clusters, the EKS and AKS clusters on Azure and AWS. And from the source code, we build an image. And then when we combine the image with the IIC, we, we can deploy the service as a whole stack to AWS and Azure. Um, since we are talking about hyperscalers here, there is a uh, one thing that is very uh, very few people talk about, but that's like access management. We have around 120 AWS accounts. And managing access to 120 AWS accounts is really a lot of work, especially since we need to make sure that only uh, that only the people that, that need access have access, what we call the least privileged principle. And uh, of course, you can now create um, AWS IAM users with uh, access key pairs and leverage those to deploy the service, but you will very quickly find that you will lose the overview of your users because they will be distributed in accounts and uh, you, they will not, uh, then, it, then there will be some created per team, people sometimes fluctuate, you, uh, then you need to retire those and somebody needs to manage the life cycle of these things. And therefore we decided we do not want to have AWS IAM users at all. We leverage an open source tool uh, uh, from HashiCorp called Vault. And Vault uh, actually allows our pipelines to uh, request permissions to deploy to a cloud account. How does this work? Our pipelines actually don't have cloud account credentials, but they have Vault credentials. And in Vault, uh, credentials are actually uh, identify an entity, and then that entity can have access to different accounts. So that means if I am if uh, if I, my service pipeline wants to deploy to an AWS account, it will take it's pipeline credentials, request from Vault access to a specific AWS account, and Vault will check, is this actually something this technical entity is allowed to do? And then it will create access credentials for that, uh, for that pipeline, which are valid for uh, 30 minutes, and those can be used. So this seems like, a, if we look at this for the first time, it seems like a lot of extra effort, uh, but it really brings you a lot of benefit security-wise. First of all, it's a central tool that we manage. So we have a central inventory tool that's synced to Vault so we know who has which access, which accesses. Secondarily, this Vault is something only reachable from, the, from our intranet, which means if somebody loses credentials, however this happens, nobody outside of Siemens is actually able to use those credentials because you cannot reach this Vault cluster from outside of Siemens. Going on. So we've talked about Azure, another cloud hyperscaler, Alibaba, we, we very quickly uh, went into, but not very deeply. Um, now, what happens if suddenly um, there is another requirement? And the requirement now is we have customers that actually, they, they love mainstream, they love IoT, they love industry 4.0. They want to do 
they want to do something with their data, the data in their factories. But the security does not let them use public cloud infrastructure. And therefore, now please deploy MindSphere into customer data centers as well. And this now is a bit more challenging because now suddenly you lose every or the whole cloud stack, you lose all the service layers. You don't no longer have infrastructure as a service. You do not longer have platform or container as a service. And uh, that means you need to rebuild all of this for yourself while of course, trying to maintain as much of the original code that you already created because every line of code that you write is first of all, more investment. And secondarily, you need to maintain it, which means you will have to maintain a complete fork of your code, which is ex uh, which is uh, actually lots of effort because you have to replicate the whole life cycle. So now let's have a look at what we can, how we can somehow manage this. Again, looking at our uh, cloud aware service pattern, let's extend this a bit. So first of all, it's very simple. Uh, what would we do for uh, the first idea we have? Yeah, let's add, add an adapter that can actually talk to which ad, uh, whichever hosting and data persists the periphery we have available in a customer data center. So let's do this. The next point would be, okay, this is um, a hosting, we already have Kubernetes, and Kubernetes is potentially deployable to data centers. So let's pick something uh, uh, that uh, a Kubernetes flavor that's actually deployable. And in our case, we selected OpenShift for that. So OpenShift is our Kubernetes uh, our Kubernetes platform for our customer data centers. Then uh, we have already talked about, we need for data persistence, we need uh, SQL stores and we need no SQL stores. And that for this, uh, for this we'll leverage Postgres uh, and Apache HBase. And then uh, as periphery, and I will not uh, iterate over all possible periphery that we use, just two examples. For asynchronous communication, for queues, we use RabbitMQ and for larger asynchronous communications for data buses, we leverage Apache Kafka. All of this, all this whole stack can be deployed to the customer data center. And this LPC, LPC, by the way, is a main sphere specific thing. It stands for local private cloud. Um, that means customer data center. I will go into that in a later slide. Um, uh, the LPC adapter actually uh, interfaces with all of these components to, um, uh, to actually make the same business logic work that works on AWS and Azure also work on in a, in a customer data center. So we, have, we, we now know what we want to do. So let's see how we can deploy this. We now have in addition to what we had, uh, what we already had, we have now a customer data center target. Uh, we of course, uh, I, and, uh, here I also separated the um, deployment code, namely the Helm charts, that we use to deploy to Kubernetes out of the service code, just to demonstrate how we actually use and reuse this. And our central team now also has to manage the setup of the uh, uh, customer data center hosting engine. Basically the whole stack will be centrally set up by a team and then we can just leverage the service code to deploy to the customer data center. So how would we do this? First of all, the central team sets up the hosting layers which means the OpenShift, the databases, the periphery. Then we want to leverage uh, container images. For that, we have a central container registry. So we check in images once and we can deploy them to AWS Azure and into customer data centers. And then and now comes the question, okay, how do we deploy this? How do we have deployment description that we can reuse? And for this, we leverage Helm and we leverage an open source tool, uh, um, that's part of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation that's called Argo CD. And Argo CD basically allows us to, um, to really deploy from Helm shots that are checked in into Git repositories directly to any Kubernetes cluster that is connected to the Argo CD instance. And this is how you, how we, how you can replicate your code and how you can reuse most of the, of the source code that you produce over multiple hyperscalers and even into customer data center. Of course, there are some duplication, but we only want to duplicate the minimum amount of, uh, of, of components because of course each duplication means extra effort, extra investment. So now I've already talked a bit about um, these, uh, with the, about the word local private cloud. So I want to just very quickly go into how does this all actually fall into main sphere offering structure? So as you can see, the hyperscalers on top are 
uh, available uh, under the label of Mansphere Public uh, Software as a Service, which means you can order uh, a Mansphere account on our public platforms, and you will get an account on either uh, on either AWS Azure and Alibaba, depending on what you choose. We also provide this whole uh, uh, the whole cloud deployments as a what we call a virtual private cloud deployment, which means customers can order Mansphere to be deployed on a hyperscaler, but in their accounts, which means we will then request from the customer access to these accounts, but they will own the account structure. It will only be connected to their internet, basically. Um, this is something a lot of customers want, and therefore we also provide this. Of course, we only provide it for hyperscalers that we already use internally for, for our public SaaS offer. And then we already, that's what I already touched on a bit, there is the Mansfield local private cloud, which is defined as deployment in a customer data center, not in the cloud. So now we have seen a full pipeline, but you, the pipeline that we saw was basically only this. Developer develops something, we check it into GitLab. We have a deployment pipeline that we elaborated on, and then it's in an environment. But to be honest, that somehow it seems a bit small because you will have, usually you will not only deploy, directly deploy from a development version to a, a customer available um, environment, because you will have to have different quality stages and so, on, so and so forth. So what we talked about actually putting this all into perspective, actually we talked about the deployment to an integration environment up to, up to now. And that uh, actually, uh, when we talk about our internal system, that is now followed by testing, we have functional test suits, we have non-functional test suits, and of course also non-functional, but I wanted to um, emphasize this point, we also have security tests that run there. Um, you do your, you do your um, initial evaluation of scaling capabilities, for example, on this environment, because you need to know it in higher, in, in, uh, in your production already. You don't want to experiment with scaling and loads only once you're on production. You will do it here. And then once these tests are green, you will move to pre-prod because you have multiple services and multiple services in different stages. So you will, uh, you will have a pre-prod environment that mirrors your production environment as well as possible. And there will actually validate new releases with a separate, uh, with a separate test suite that's really only there for pre-release validation. And after this is done, there, this is really where the, where, the, where the production, the customer accessible environment comes into play. And of course, you all want to be already told about it. We, that's why we leverage infrastructure as code well, because over all these stages, we want to replicate all the infrastructure that we create with a version in a, in a version manner so that we can make sure what we test on intake is really what we deploy to pre prod and production. This is the container registry that we use for a build once approach so that we actually can, we make, can really make sure that whatever we tested on our integration and pre prod environments is really what we deploy to our production environment. We do this to lower the risk of anything, of anything problematic, of any issues happening on prod as much as possible. And that also means before we even deploy the first, uh, the first service code to the first environment, and before we even create containers, there are also internal queue gates for static code analysis, for internal quality, unit testing, static code analysis, reporting, in uh, um, uh, coverages and uh, and linting results, for example, into Sonoki. And if when this whole pipeline, everything is done, only then will code be deployed to customer uh, to customer accounts and to customer citizens. So everything that we call private cloud is a virtual private cloud, which means. Uh, customer uh, customer owned Azure AWS accounts or customer data centers only code that has been on, gone through our validation pipeline is on production already will be there so that we can make sure that the functional and non-functional criteria are, that we promise our customers and the quality is really where we want to head. Okay, so um, this was actually the part about how to deploy a service. And I have uh, at the end, of course, you can imagine when you um, have a system as large as this and you want to run it, and this is something where, this is, uh, this is something I'm working with every day as because I'm part of mainstream global operations. Um, you will have some operations tooling around. And I want to very quickly describe what we use. 
So first thing that you want to have is a bit of is a lot of transparency about your production system, which means you want to have monitoring there and very intensive monitoring. And uh, our monitoring solution is built around a central Grafana for visualization. That's also the source for our operational uh, incident alarming chain and a data that, that uh, gets data from different sources. One, one thing that we're leveraging, for example, to get metrics out of Kubernetes clusters is InfluxDB. And we uh, basically we funnel uh, data from Prometheus, that's that, which is running on the clusters, for persistence into InfluxDB. And then we can visualize it from there in Grafana. We also have Elasticsearch as a, Elastic as a, as a data source, as well as native um, or cloud metrics from AWS CloudWatch, for example, or from Azure. We additionally use a tool called Uptrends, that, and that's just for uh, basically availability checks. This just um, the uh, Uptrends allows you to call your uh, web interface from all around the world and see if it's available, which helps us a lot because we have customers all around the globe. Uh, and the second thing, of course, is uh, logs. So everything you want for debugging and to find out. Uh, um, to, to find root causes of issues, you need service logs. You need an, uh, to, um, and for this, we use FluentD, which we run on all the Kubernetes classes. And this, this either goes into cloud native storage on AWS as free, and then we leverage Athena for querying, or on private cloud, we go into an elastic search cluster and then Kibana for querying. And this is actually um, what I wanted to talk about uh, today. So thanks for all your attention. And I believe we have some time for questions now, if there are any. Yes, we do. Thank you very much for your talk, Toby. Very interesting to see how MindSphere uses uh, multiple pipelines and multiple environments. And also, I like that you also like talked a bit about monitoring, because I think a lot of people think just about the application, and then uh, they kind of forget about monitoring. It's also an important part of the whole equation, right? Definitely, definitely. So usually people that forget about monitoring will be reminded about, uh, very quickly about monitoring once their system is down and they don't yeah. know why. Exactly. So you can quickly deploy something, but then uh, if you don't monitor, that uh, can go bad quickly. Yeah, we got a question from uh, Gonzaga. I'm sorry if I pronounced your name wrong. Um, in the time of serverless Lambda function, is it still relevant to talk about microservices? Um, yeah, I think it is because um, the microservice system is less about technical structure internal. Of course, it has to do with technical internal structure. But uh, you partition microservices not like you would partition classes in an entity relationship diagram. diagram. You partition microservices according to customer problem domain. And then you can have, of course, internal components that are hosted either uh, inside one microservice that are hosted on, for example, function as a service like Lambda. But it's very relevant to actually be uh, have an agile development environment because you, you alongside your the borders of your microservices, this is where you actually have small system boundaries and the microservices uh, against its, each other should be independently deployable. So you can have, of course, a hundred Lambda functions, but you will never be very agile and very nimble in your deployment or very quick in your deployment if they are a hundred interdependent Lambda functions that call each other all the time. So the microservice the, uh, paradigm, independently of which hosting environment you use, um, gives you the isolation that you need to move code quickly from the developer's brain over versioning into the target environment. I hope that answers, answers the question. Yeah, I think so, yeah. And also, it's kind of important, right? If you have the numbers on AWS, um, then you're kind of locked in, right, into AWS. And uh, with the microservice approach, you can also go to another cloud provider. I guess there's also like independent um, Lambda-like things, but uh, yeah. So we, we have Lambdas, uh, we have yeah. Lambda functions, and it doesn't really matter how you write your microservices. You can write your microservices with Lambda. Um, but you uh, and you have, for example, Azure Functions to replicate it in Azure, and there are also uh, Kubernetes versions to host Function as a service. So you can use Function as a service uh, um, either cloud natively or on or on Kubernetes directly to have to use the same code 
to try or at least try because it gets a bit funky because uh, there is lots of the when you use function as a service, the boundary between your service code and your hosting infrastructure really uh, starts to disappear. So you need to now create an artificial hard boundary uh, to be able to replicate code. But this is something that's very specific to the application. Thank you. Yeah, we have another question from Wolfram. Have you thought about using Elastic Heartbeat instead of Uptrends for availability checks, seeing that you already use Elasticsearch and Kibana? Uh, we, have, uh, uh, we have not thought about this. Uh, we are using Elasticsearch and Kibana in a self-deployed manner, Uptrends. And I don't know that product, to be honest. But uh, uh, the, uh, but uh, what Uptrends allows is we don't have to host anything by ourselves. We use this as software, as a service as a, uh, that we buy and that we basically also then just attach onto our Grafana as a data source. But I'm curious, so uh, please feel free to send me a link to that. Uh, my email address is on the slide set. Just send it to me. Thank you. Cool. Yeah. And uh, another question from me. Um, why did you choose OpenShift? And how do you manage uh, rootless containers if you have that feature enabled? Um, so the nice thing about OpenShift is that um, we actually have partners that manage the OpenShift clusters. That's the interesting part. So we actually, so uh, we, we, um, we um, leverage OpenShift basically uh, in a, as a, as a off-the-shelf software. So basically that's provided via a partner that we work together um, um, to us as a uh, as a deployment platform, because this actually frees our uh, frees us from building. Uh, we have a lot of OpenShift knowledge now because we did the experimentation with OpenShift, of course, before we decided to go on to that. But um, it frees our operations team from uh, the whole uh, OpenShift stack, basically. So we we actually directly have uh, the OpenShift providers as a partner there. So I also I can uh, if you uh, if uh, if you want an answer to your question I can find it I don't know it off, off the top of my head unfortunately. Okay, and um, you don't know if um, I guess if you use the rootless containers because that was also would also impact yourself right because then you you can't use the uh, upstream container images most of them because uh, they are mostly a root. Uh, yeah. Um, so we, anyways, so we, uh, we, anyways, harden all our container images. We mm -hmm. never okay. use public upstream images. Yep. All of our container images are we take public images, mm -hmm. we harden them. For example, we remove root access from them. Mm -hmm. For example, and uh, and other stuff. We uh, and and do uh, do a couple of other things where we limit capabilities and stuff like that. Uh, and only then do we reuse them. Mm -hmm. So this is absolutely not an issue for us because, okay. anyways, how we use containers even on AWS and Azure. Mm -hmm. Okay, good to know. Yeah. Okay, I think that's. Do we have another? Um, that's not a question, right? Uh, da, da, da. I guess there's a comment from a user. Uh, the maintenance effort also increases the smaller and cut your infrastructure into microservices is. Having an infrastructure of 100 at Lambda, and that's basically what you said, right? An infrastructure of 100 Lambda function could lead to a nano service architecture, then you might face a really heavy maintenance effort. Yeah, I think what this uh, whoever wrote this is talking about is that um, there is a wide misunderstanding of how to cut microservices. Microservices are, as I said, not cut like classes in an entity relationship diagram. If you do that, you will create more communication and dependency overhead that you gain. You really have to cut them by customer problem domain, and you have to basically reinforce the, the main borders here with stuff like uh, asynchronous communication, maybe even data replication to be independent of other services. You need to make sure that if your service is the only service that's left standing in the whole platform, it is able to work. And that's the important thing. Otherwise, because if you don't enforce this, you will also have all of these dependencies that you have during runtime during deployment. So this is a really, really uh, important thing that when you do microservices, it's really about the problem domain and its boundaries. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Thank you, Toby, very much for your talk. I think we don't have any more questions.